we can think of tumors based on cell of origin and organ of origin, but we can also think of it in terms of, of biology. And what we really need to get straight is, you know, who's at risk and how do we get this diagnosed? Because we know that early diagnosis is the key, key to this. What's already been pointed out today is that this disease is one of an increasing uh, incidence. Uh, and in fact, that 171,000 number you saw up here is putting this disease at risk for no longer being rare. Once it crosses 200,000, this disease is classified now as not rare. What's, what's the implication of that? Well, it, it's, it's a dual, it's a double-edged sword. There's good things about not being a rare disease, and there's some not so good things about it. We can think in terms of incidence of net. Uh, why is that increasing? We know that we're scoping more. We've got better technology in terms of looking for it. Uh, there's more awareness among practitioners because there's more you can do for it. So this nihilistic approach of you know, it doesn't matter, uh, is, is sort of not there. So when we think about GI nets, when you look at the incidence of being about two and a half per 100,000, these are older data, but when the incidence is five per 100,000, half of those are GI nets. And these, these neuronal tumors, again, are very varied. And I think one of the toughest things that we get wrong in the medical community is lumping them all together as malignant tumors. They're not all malignant tumors. And when a pathologist reads out a neuroendocrine tumor, it does not say the word cancer or carcinoma or even malignant neoplasm. It just basically says that the pathologist, from what's seen on their slide, there's no indication that there is invasiveness or the potential to be a neoplastic state. So they put the ball back, the ball back in our court. We're the ones in the clinical side to correlate patho other aspects, imaging, clinical symptoms and things to figure it out. Um, but when we think about GI nets, they range from the heterogeneity of almost all benign and starting in the stomach, where elevated gastrin with grade one neuroendocrine tumors, type one, uh, grade one, type one, uh, where there's elevated gastrin, we don't want to operate on those people. Even though there's multiple little bumps in the stomach, the last thing we want to do is do a subtotal gastrectomy or total gastrectomy. But if it's a type three, where the gastrin's normal, then we really need to think about being aggressive with surgery because that's more like gastric cancer. So you can see, when we say a gastric carcinoid, we go from one extreme of saying, don't worry about it, it's a mosquito bite, to the other extreme, you've got to be aggressive and have your stomach removed. So, so this is the part that medical people who don't focus on it can easily get it wrong. So lung is the next second, is the second largest site, comprises about 25%. Uh, and when we look at historically, lung is very much underrepresented in the clinical research world. And as I've gone through this journey for the last 20 years, I'd go to sponsors and say, why are we ignoring lung? And it's just uh, frustrating in that you're taking a subset of a rare disease and even making it more rare to study from a, a, a drug development perspective. But now the fact that we do have advances with the Everolimus in the Radiant 4 trial, where we've pushed out drug development into all subtypes of malignant. So we're certainly making progress in not ignoring some of these more infrequent subtypes. So we've talked about classifying this disease according to the organ of origin but we also want to talk about it as it relates to what the grade differentiation and the proliferative rate gets factored in there as well. So <clears throat> the first thing that when the 
ball starts rolling, when the dominoes start falling, the first thing that falls is what the pathologist says. Everything begins literally uh, from a diagnostic perspective uh, under the microscope. Because if we can't prove it, uh, then there's always suspect. Uh, and here, we want to differentiate between the well-differentiated and the poorly differentiated, and that's the big cut point. But what we see now when we call it neuroendocrine tumors, they're all well differentiated. So that's going to leave out from this talk the uh, uh, lower, uh, this lower group, the poorly differentiated group. Um, so we think of mitotic index as something that's commonly used or proliferative index as it relates to KI67 staining. This is a specialized monoclonal antibody that is applied to the tissue and the percent of, of nuclear, of the nuclei in division is calculated. So there's always been a little bit of, of controversy in the area of KI67 index as it relates to which antibody and how good it is. The mitotic index is where the pathologist actually counts cells. Now, you know the pathologist's not going to do it. It's going to be one of the techs, right? But what they, what they do, ideally, is to print out about 500 cells or such. And they look at and they visually do a count. And uh, that that's, gives us the biology as it relates to what we think of in terms of type 1, where the mitotic index is less than 1 mitotic cell per 10 high power fields. So that's essentially saying the tumor's not growing. As we go up in aggressiveness, you can see that when we get to two to 10, that's a totally different biology. And we wanna respect that from how we monitor that patient, surveil that patient, uh, and how we treat that patient with medications. What happened this year, about February, uh, in the world of pathology, it was a, sort of a landslide where a new group was, was uh, agreed upon. Uh, you notice in the last slide, we stopped off at the G2. So we do realize that there is a more aggressive uh, subgroup that's now called grade 3. And again, the word neuroendocrine tumor is used. This is not carcinoma, but it's going to behave like carcinoma. Uh, but it's not going to be quite as aggressive. But this is the area that we're struggling a lot in because it's so important because we don't necessarily want to include this, these, this group in, in the management of this, but we also don't necessarily want to include it down here either. So this is an area that we're really focused on uh, trying to get better and understanding it uh, more than what we under, what we, where we are now. The other way that we like to classify people is to say, are they functional or not functional? Why is that important? Well, it has a lot to do with the suppression of symptoms. So if it's functional, the somatostatin analogs become critical in, uh, for suppressing uh, the substances that are being released by the tumor that's causing those symptoms. So that's a critical aspect in terms of classification. But most are non-functional, meaning that there's not a clinical syndrome, flushing, watery diarrhea, uh, low blood sugar, high blood sugar, uh, things that we commonly associate with an elevated uh, hormone. ZE syndrome for gastrin, VIPoma uh, for uh, VIP and VIPoma syndromes, and things that we know from history we want to treat a little bit differently. So if they're not functional, then where do the symptoms come from? Well, those symptoms are more of just tumor bulk. From This would be pain, fatigue, loss of appetite, possibly nausea. Uh, so those are not specific to a hormone being secreted by the tumor, but more related to the presence of the tumor being in the body. You can see here those symptoms that, classify, that qualify for being non-functional, things that we've discussed, and those that are specific to a hormone. That hormone can be an amino acid, like serotonin, or it's more likely to be a peptide. Um, 
if not an amino acid. So it's only really a small group, about 10%, that really do get classified as functional. And if we look at carcinoid, uh, this is where the syndrome is present in those that have metastatic disease, mostly the liver. So it's these liver tumors that are secreting the product that's causing the debility of, of uh, what's associated with high, in this case, high serotonin levels. And that would be specifically the flushing, the watery diarrhea, but also the right heart. We're very focused on how the tricuspid and the pulmonic valve are functioning. Is there stenosis of the pulmonic valve? Is there insufficiency of the tricuspid? All things that are critical as we monitor these patients with elevated serotonin levels. So when we think about carcinoma syndrome, we think about flushing and diarrhea. Uh, flushing, if it's maybe not related, uh, is different from flushing that is related. So you can sort of see in the postmenopausal, or perimenopausal female, it gets very confusing. For carcinoid, it's going to be dry, pinkish, pinkish red and purple, usually upper body. For hormonal flushing, it's going to be more total body and more diaphoretic or more water associated, more sweating. So these are things that if you think about somebody having both, and believe you me, we see that, that becomes very challenging because now we want to control both, and it, it uh, depends on uh, what can be done to, uh, to do that. The diarrhea is, is quite complex because, by definition, it's a chronic disease, so the symptom's chronic, watery stools, it can be nocturnal, and can be an in, incomplete response uh, to mostly over-the-counter diarrheals. Uh, uh, if you dose narcotics high enough, uh, we, usually we can control it. And now with uh, telotrostat, we even have another way of controlling it. So when we think of, of diagnosis, this is a <clears throat> what is frustrating, I think, to not only patients but healthcare providers. They get it wrong. Uh, people don't come in with a sign stamped on them, I've got carcinoid diarrhea. And when you're in a primary, when you see a primary care provider, uh, what are they seeing a lot of? You know, they, you know, they probably don't see a lot of older male with flushing. So what do they do with that patient? You know, label them male menopause, right? I've, I've seen that. Uh, and older males really should not flush. And it may not all be carcinoid, but something else may be in the differential diagnosis. So these people come in with all kinds of misdiagnoses, menopause, asthma, functional bowel disease, thyrotoxicosis, neurosis, alcoholism, IBS, edema, arthritis, food allergy. And in this, these symptoms are all shown here, and carcinoma is buried in the middle. So how are you going to flesh all that out? Gosh, there's a lot coming in that, you know, filtering. So very frequently, you're three to seven years in the delay part of this. So what causes the symptoms, once these symptoms develop, what causes, what triggers the diagnosis? Well, it's another symptom, right? So that symptom could be weight loss, could be pain, uh, something more than just flushing or something more than just chronic diarrhea that comes and goes, acts like, most, mostly diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but also, is the patient telling the story correctly? And is the physician and, and the healthcare service asking the right questions? Because I think as those two things get it right, you can flesh out better uh, the symptom complexes. Uh, so it, it really starts with talking to the patient to, to fully understand this. So what are the hallmarks of carcinoid? This is a term that in 1907, uh, a German pathologist named Obendorfer gave to it. Uh, this pathologist saw cells underneath the microscope that was not cancer, but it was cancer-like. So this is a term that our European colleagues will not let us use in the medical literature. If I write the word carcinoid in a report, I mean, I get hammered to the tooth and nail. We're supposed to use the term well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Well, think about that. That's a lot of words for, you know, carcinoid. You 
well-differentiated neurochemical tumor. That's a lot to say. And on the North American side, we're kind of used to it. It's embedded in our jargon. It's embedded in our literature. But it doesn't communicate well. It does not communicate well. So we have to be careful when we use that term. But when we do use it, we're talking about a disease process that's indolent. We're talking about a process in which the defect is in the fact that the guest in your body won't leave. If that's ever happened to you, if you've had guests in your home that refuses to leave. So the defect is they won't die. In the body, these cells are supposed to die. Those unwanted guests are supposed to know when to go. On the carcinoma side, it's a defect in mitosis. These cells now, they're rapidly dividing, so those guests in your home now are multiplying. Benign and malignant, these by definition are all malignant. Size is not as important in predicting metastatic disease. Here, size has a better predicting characteristic. Two to five years, sometimes longer in misdiagnosis. This is usually diagnosed within a year of the onset of, of symptoms or screening. So this is obviously diagnosed late, may die of other diseases, more likely to die, to, to die of cancer. Sonomic syndromes related to this we've talked about, less likely to have these sonomic syndromes, and likely cause, if we can't cure it, uh, then it's likely to be responsible so, of deaths. And so that's, this is where I'm seeing more and more is that people are living with this chronic disease and dying from something else. And that's our job as professionals that take care of neuroconsumer patients, that we, that we control the disease and uh, do our very best in improving quality of life and quantity of life. And then right heart failure, we usually don't have to screen our carcinoma patients for right heart failure. So the other hallmark of somatostatin receptor, of, of neuroendocrine tumors is the expression of the somatostatin receptor. So this was recognized uh, in the early 80s, and as we came through the decade of the 1980s into the, into the 90s, we had imaging characteristics. Uh, here is uh, uh, Indium 111, Octrea scan. This was approved by the FDA in June of 1994. We were ecstatic when we got the Octrea scan. This was like being able to see when you were before you were in a in a in a closet without a light. So this was clearly a new day in the management of neuroconsumers. But look, it took us uh, till last year. It took us 22 years to get to the next generation of imaging. And we knew in 1994, we had PET scanners back then. Uh, and, and over that 22 years, a lot of that time was spent in developing PET agents. The PET camera gives us much better uh, resolution, much better spatial resolution of these tumors so we can see more. And that's evident in this uh, uh, report by Sandowski uh, at J in JCO in 2001, in 2016, I mean, where if you just look at the gallium scan, total number of lesions, 847 out of a denominator of 890, that's 95%. You look at the initial imaging, Octrea scan or Indian pentatriotide, this is at 30%. So we're seeing three times more with simply better technology but also the peptide, the Dota, the Dota part of the gallium-68 has a higher affinity for the receptor. So we're really dealing with two advances in technology. One's the physical aspect of the camera, but we've got a better binding peptide. So you combine those two things, uh, we're clearly making advances. If we look at bone specifically, 95% uh, of these lesions seen in the, this, whereas only about 15%. So this technology really helps us in understanding delineating bone disease. Okay, now we get into management issues. Uh, management, clearly, early, di early disease, surgery, cured, potentially. Metastatic disease, somatostatin analogs then becomes the backbone in terms of managing it. From a surgical perspective, the, air, the part that becomes controversial is when you do have metastatic disease, when you can't cure the disease with surgery, should we take out a primary? Well, if it's symptomatic, it's a no-brainer, right? But if it's asymptomatic, that's where we struggle because we're never going to do a clinical prospective uh, 
trial of taking people to the operating room or not to really delineate this. But Dr. Pommier's group, among others, have looked at this, and people who have had their primary resected, their outcomes, survival outcomes, appear to be better. This is progression-free, and this is, on the right, is overall survival. So when we look at that, how do we interpret that? Should we be overly aggressive, more enthusiastic? Uh, do we go after this or not? The problem here is that when you operate on people, their comorbidities determines outcome. So these patients for surgery are specially selected. So they're better performing people. Uh, so that becomes very confusing to us on the medical side to know whether that applies to everybody. So when we can, we can. Hannah Han and Weinberg put out a, uh, uh, the hallmarks of cancer and where all the types of problems that go on in this cancer cell uh, is looked at as a potential target. Drugs that we use, the SMASTA analogs, will slow by using that we can inhibit the proliferative uh, signaling. Our mTOR drugs like Everolimus, we can influence uh, the cell death. We can encourage these cells not to grow and in some cases to, to die. And then we can use drugs that induce angiogenesis like sunitinib, uh, interferon and mTOR inhibitors also. So where's the data for some of this? Um, as we've gone through understanding the biology, we know that in, when we see uh, neuron and tumors that are well differentiated, um, the expression of the spinostatin receptor is the hallmark. And as we see more aggressiveness, as we go from uh, uh, grade one out to more poorly differentiated, we see now the loss of the somatostatin receptor. And this is where the FDG, the traditional uh, scanning agent, becomes uh, preferred to follow this disease. So early on, a, a frac some of these uh, will have a component that will uh, take up radioactive glucose uh, in the poorly differentiated ones. And this, this is that grade three I talked about, the well-differentiated grade three. This is where we, we may look at both uh, forms of imaging. And in the high grade, we prefer uh, to do strictly FDG glucose. Now, somatostatin is wonderful in suppressing a whole host of bioactive substances. Some, uh, these would not only be serotonin, but possibly growth factors. But the, some of the limitations here is that when it comes to serotonin, we, don't, we can suppress it up to 50% in at least three quarters of the patients, but we don't block the formation of serotonin. So in February this year, we, were, we had a, uh, the approval of a new, new class of drugs uh, that inhibit the production of serotonin. So now this trial, telosterostat, was done in patients who had diarrhea on somatostat. So the approval is with the combination, a product that suppresses release and also a product that inhibits the synthesis of serotonin. So where's the value of this? Well, the limitation with somatostat and analogs is it doesn't take the serotonin levels down to levels that could be safe in the body. The telotrostat ethyl product inhibits that and has the added potential of doing that in most patients. So not only can it control diarrhea, but it gets at the underlying problem of serotonin. So this is the data that FDA acted on, uh, placebo in terms of diarrhea reduction, and the 250 and 500 milligram both doses performed well. And here we can see that the 5-HI reduction uh, was sustained and active uh, at both doses. We actually saw better, better suppression at the, at the higher dose of 500. Now, as I got into, in, into this uh, by the mid-1990s, it was obvious to me that somatostatin analogs were not just quality of life drugs. They also improved quantity of life. So it was pretty obvious to me if you take care of the patient in terms of raising the quality, quantity follows. And these were my initial 90 uh, patients that I saw at Vanderbilt. And this is what the historical literature showed. So I knew, we were, I, knew I was on to something. And about 1994 or so, I figured it was, it was about time to make a career out of it. 
And then as I moved to LSU, and now we had the LAR, where people didn't have to rely on people's memory. And so this was some, again, the early data, non-randomized, uh, single center experience. But it went on into clinical trials where patients were randomized between placebo and octreotide. And this, this trial was only done in Germany. The rest of the world knew that this was an antineoplastic. So I was, you know, based on ethics, I was not able to do these kind of trials because I knew that the treatment group would win. And then it went on and showed in the PROMED trial the group got octreotide. So now so there's science behind it. And it went only, not only went to uh, octreotide, but it went into lanreotide in the clarinet study. So now you have a double uh, indicator. Other advances, sunitinib, everolimus, in these prospective randomized trials, you can see that the treated group does better than the untreated group. And then we get into using alkylating agents and 5-FU in metastatic neuroendocrine uh, in G2, and those of these are pancreatic, could be lung. And this was really quite revolutionary in terms of practice changing. So patients who got the combination, you can see these are partial responses. So this literally was not uh, easy to dissect out because industry would not support this trial. The government would not support this trial. So this was Jonathan Strasberg and Larry Coles at Moffitt who basically did all the preliminary work and ended up being in, uh, published in Cancer in January 2011. These are some of the uh, imaging. This is before, this is after, patient one, patient two, before, after, patient three, before, after. And this has all been validated by other in institutions and now becomes uh, a standard in our management. So this is where I look at the algorithm of how I uh, think about uh, managing this disease. And again, I'm going to put the qualifications being G1, G2. I look at being pancreatic primary versus intestinal. So this is more G2, this is more G1, but we can see G2 in intestinal, and we can see G1 in pancreas, so I don't want to be that, but I'm just saying more likely. So we want to know, is the primary specific therapy? Do we need to resect that primary? Would it be safe? Is it be best or not? That decision needs to be made. And then if it's not uh, resected, we may, we may go on to systemic therapy, octreotide, lanreotide, local regional therapies, apply to both. Uh, cytotoxic therapy, I showed you before the streptozotisin, I mean the temozolomide and 5-FU is specific for pancreatic. Doesn't work that well on the G1s. Not been tested real well, but not something that we reach to early on. Um, and so here you can see that we may have more to offer on this side. We've got Everolimus here. We also have Everolimus over here. We've got Sinitinib here. We have Telotristat over here. And then maybe one of the last things we might do in the G1s is looking at, looking at this. But what's exciting is this middle part is once we go through regional reduction therapy, if that's appropriate, if that's where most of the disease is, if that's where the disease is progressing, then uh, in next year we'll have what's called peptide receptor radiotherapy you'll hear more about today. And then there's always clinical trials and historically alpha interferon. Used to use quite a bit of it, don't use it anymore. Uh, but clinical trials is really where the answer lies in the refractory person that's gone through standard of care options. And that's an area that we're obviously focused on uh, at UK. I'm just going to show you the, the data that you'll see this again later. This is the uh, survival outcomes uh, probability, the octreotide given at a higher dose, uh, 60 milligrams daily versus the PRRT or lutathera or lutetium-177 dotatate. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference between these two curves. In fact, when we go to quantitate that, what's helpful is to use what's called a hazard ratio, and that's the risk of progression. So in this case, there is a basically 80% a chance of not progressing on Lutathera. So that's highly, highly significant. And in the world of oncology, this is probably one of the very best outcomes of one of the very best hazard ratios we've ever seen. So I think it's probably a no-brainer that the FDA will approve it. Where will PRT? It'll be in our progressive patients. We'll have to see how the indication reads in our bulky patients. And I may probably use it earlier in bone disease, May. 
So the conclusions here, this, this disease is heterogeneous, it has an increasing incidence, it's classified according to primary site, grade, functional status, and stage. Somatostatin analogs are the backbone of symptom and tumor management. Targeted therapies with everolimus or mTOR or sunitinib, tyrosine kinase increases progression-free survival. 5-hydroxytryptophan inhibitors improve symptoms as well as serotonin control. Gallium-68 dotatate PET significantly impacts clinical decision-making. In my shop, it's about one out of three patients. Uh, PRT using lutetium significantly increases PFS, as you saw, compared to higher dose since pending FDA approval. Our future challenges... What more can we do to further improve the quality of life? Because we know we're not there yet. And what can we do to further improve the survival outcomes? So what you're going to see going forward is combinatorial approaches and also the big elephant in the room that no one can ignore is how do we get the body's immune system to wake up? 